Hello friends, welcome to the NEET PG Biochemistry Recall Session 2023. So, I know that you are all are having a mixed feeling, like some are very happy with the result, some are not so happy. So, this is an end product of every exam, not only really NEET PG 2023. So, what we have to do is or what we have to keep in mind is that life ahead is not a life of impossibilities, but there is possibilities among all the impossibilities. What we have to do is we have to find the possibilities out of the impossibilities. So, with this small message, let us discuss the questions of biochemistry. Analyzing the questions, we all know that almost 17 or 18 questions were asked from biochemistry directly or indirectly. Uh, most of the questions, uh, you all know that around uh, 9 questions came from vitamins as we expected. Always we used to say that we have to learn biochemistry, especially the vitamins every day, just like eating vitamin capsules every day. So, that is it. Uh, then uh, lipid, carbohydrate and all those topics were asked but one or two questions and that too from an expected area only glycogen storage disorder, then sphingolipidosis etc. None of the questions came directly from the core biochemistry like the metabolic pathway or the cycles. So, that era is over. Now, what is ahead of us is the era of applied biochemistry. So, what we have to concentrate on whenever we are preparing for any entrance exams or competitive exams is that previous year questions always important, but for NEET PG the previous year questions are not repeated as such, but previous year question topics definitely is the area that we have to focus on. Then applied questions, uh, scenario based questions, image based question, there is no preparation, no preparation is complete without these uh, three, especially in the basic sciences, applied image based and scenario based. So, uh, let us discuss the questions one by one. A four year old child has easy fatigability. The mother also complained that the child was more hungry between meals. The child recovers after food Liver examination revealed no glycogen. The enzyme most likely deficient is. So, here the child is a 4 year old child and the child, the mother is saying that the, the child is more hungry between the meals, which means that between meals is the time where the child is fasting stage fasting stage and this fasting stage is uh, not what you can say that a prolonged fasting or a proper fasting, it is an early fasting stage. So, even between the meals, that is between meals is hardly 4 to 6 hours, so that, that itself the child is not able to uh, cope up with. Then the child recovers after food, liver examination revealed no glycogen. So, when there is no glycogen means that no glycogen is synthesized, which means that the enzyme that is defective here is glycogen, enzyme that synthesizes glycogen and that is glycogen synthase. Okay. So, this is a case of glycogen synthase defect and glycogen synthase defect is called as the type 0 glycogen storage disorder, but actually speaking this is not a glycogen storage disorder because glycogen is not stored here. So, it is some, it is a kind of unclassified or what you can say is that it is that is why it is called as a type 0 uh, glycogen storage disorder. It, they are not saying 1, 2 or 3 type of GSD, but as it is in uh, concerned with the glycogen metabolism, that is glycogen synthase is an enzyme in the glycogen metabolism, we are including it under glycogen storage disorder, but actually there is no storage of glycogen. Okay, so, we will just discuss about this type 0 glycogen storage disorder. So, let us discuss this glycogen synthase defect uh, in detail, that is the glycogen synthase 
defect which is considered as a type 0 glycogen storage disorder. Truly speaking, it is not a glycogen storage disorder. The first question is, is it liver or muscle? Usually, GSDs are liver GSD or muscle GSD. So, this is the gene defect can be a muscle glycogen synthase defect or it can be a liver glycogen synthase defect. Okay. So, first we will discuss this uh, liver glycogen synthase defect. This liver glycogen synthase defect uh, is it a fatal condition? If it is manifesting early pregnancy, that means in utero, if it is manifesting, then early death occur. The child will not survive. But if it is manifesting in adult, then prognosis is good. Okay. And then we will see what are the biochemical defect in a glycogen synthase defect. So, uh, the biochemical defect is, so here what happens is there is no synthesis of glycogen. So, if it is mutation in the liver glycogen synthase, then the synthesis of glycogen in the liver is affected. So, we are discussing about the liver. So, there is no synthesis of glycogen in liver. So, what will happen? There is a peculiar manifestation that is pre-breakfast or early morning drowsiness or fatigue. Okay, so, which means that the child when it is in an early fasting state, we know that there is no dietary glucose then what is the source of blood glucose? It is the glycogen, but there is no glycogen in this child. So, the child is fe uh, feeling drowsy or fatigue. Why? Because of uh, early fasting hypoglycemia. Okay. So, then what will happen? So, if there is no glycogen stores, then what is the next source of blood glucose? The next source of blood glucose is gluconeogenesis. So, if gluconeogenesis should happen, what are the substrate for gluconeogenesis? That is one is lactate or another one is alanine. All these are the sources of blood glucose. Okay, fine. So, what will happen to the substrates? So, they go for gluconeogenesis. So, as a result, what will happen? The blood lactate level and alanine level decreases. So, blood lactate and alanine decreases. So, once the substrates are reduced, because all the substrates are used up, then uh, if the child is not getting the next food, then what will happen? If the child is having food, then there is no problem. If there is no source of uh, diet in the child, then what will happen? Then the child is going for, it has to use the triazylglycerol. From the triazylglycerol, the fatty acid is coming, it goes into oxidation. And from this, the acetyl coenzyme A is produced. So, this go for ketone body synthesis. Okay. So, what will happen? There is ketosis. Okay. So, there is hypoglycemia, blood lactate and blood alanine level is decreased and there is ketosis. So, these are the biochemical defect in a glycogen synthase defect. So, what is the treatment? The treatment is possible that is the child should not fast. So, the treatment here is we can give frequent meals, especially protein rich and also overnight is the time where the child has to fast for a long time. So, overnight 
what we can give is uncooked starch. So, the treatment possibilities are there for glycogen synthase defect. Only thing is that the child should not fast. So, what about, uh, so that is about the liver glycogen uh, synthase defect. So, what about the muscle glycogen synthase defect? In the case of muscle glycogen synthase defect, what happens is that there is no muscle glycogen. muscle glycogen. So, the especially there here the child will not be able to do anaerobic exercises. So, there will be exercise intolerance. And here there is what we can see is that whenever the child is exercising there is increased heart rate, increased heart rate and sometimes cardiac arrest can happen especially if the child is having exercise. So, uh, that is about the muscle glycogen synthase defect and most this is very very rare. So, among these two muscle glycogen and liver glycogen uh, this will be more important than the muscle glycogen synthase defect. So, totally what we have to understand is that if it is a muscle glycogen synthase defect there is no muscle glycogen. So, whatever is the function of muscle glycogen it would not be possible. Then in the other case if liver glycogen synthase is defective then what will happen uh, then uh, there is no liver glycogen. So, there is no blood source of blood glucose. So, the manifestations will be like where is the genetic defect. So, that is about the glycogen synthase defect. So, we will see the next question. So, let us discuss another question that came uh, from the same topic that is glycogen storage disorder. There are two versions written here. Uh, a young boy presented to OPD with uh, hypoglycemia after exertion or playing then becomes normal again. These episodes are recurrent after a period of activity which means that on exertion the child is having uh, difficulty but after some time the child is becoming normal. These episodes are recurrent especially after a period of activity. He has decreased serum lactate, decreased serum lactate and glucose level. The most likely diagnosis is another version is a 16 year old boy while playing had tiredness and muscle cramps. He had no free glucose, no free glucose and has low lactate level uh, in, in the blood collected soon after exercise. What is the likely diagnosis? So, this is not a liver glycogen storage disorder because this uh, child it specifically written that the drowsiness or fatigue or cramps everything is happening after a period of activity or exercise or play right. So, this is a case of muscle glycogen storage disorder. Again another clue here is that there is decreased serum lactate and glucose level which I will explain later. The child is becoming normal after a period of rest which means that there is second wind phenomenon. Second wind phenomenon means that the pain appears the, the patient or the whoever is the person which perceives the pain if he rests for some time then uh, it becomes normal that is he can do exercise with more ease. So, there is second wind phenomenon and there is decreased serum lactate and there is decreased glucose. So, this is a case of uh, McCardell's disease. This is the most common muscle glycogen storage disorder and another important point which is uh, saying that this is McCardell's disease is that this is most common in adolescent. This is the most common uh, muscle glycogen storage disorder in adolescent age group. So, this is a case of McCardell's disease. So, I will just give you some easy tips to answer any question on glycogen storage disorder whether it is liver glycogen storage disorder or muscle glycogen storage disorder. So, whenever a question is coming on glycogen storage disorder what we can see is that uh, drowsiness or fatigue 
when either it will be written as in between meals or early morning which means that this is because of fasting especially early fasting stage hypoglycemia so if this is the history then it point towards a liver glycogen storage disorder okay now if the drowsiness or fatigue or cramps or pain in the muscles if it is happening after exercise like playing or after a period of activity then it is pointing towards muscle gsd okay so we will see about this branch later first we will see about the liver gsd so in the liver gsd so once we get this history we have to find out which is the liver glycogen storage disorder here so the next thing that we have to look here is so that is from the history the next thing that we can look here is there is hepatomegaly okay so that divides it into two there is no hepatomegaly so that we have already seen that there is no liver glycogen stores in glycogen synthase defect okay now if there is hepatomegaly most of the glycogen storage disorder there is storage of either normal glycogen or abnormal glycogen so there is hepatomegaly so if there is hepatomegaly then what we can look at is some of the investigation findings so if the investigation finding most of them like almost everything there will be decreased blood glucose especially uh, like in the fasting stage or early morning stage or in between meals when you are taking the blood then there is a decreased blood glucose so as a result there should be a increased so if the blood glucose is reduced definitely we know that there is increased ketone body synthesis so ketosis will be there decreased blood glucose is there it is there for almost every liver glycogen storage disorder but the next thing that we should look is the blood lactate is increased then the next is the blood uric acid so lactic acidosis uric acid hyperuricemia and there is increased lipids like uh, serum cholesterol is elevated etc if that is given which means that there is hypoglycemia ketosis lactic acidosis hyperuricemia and Uh, there is increased hyperlipidemia so i am dividing it into these three plus or elevated or decreased or i should say normal okay so if blood lactate level is normal the uric acid level is normal and there is no hyperlipidemia so that is dividing into two branches so all these three if it is elevated hypoglycemia and ketosis will be there for every liver glycogen storage disorder that will not divide them into two branches but lactic acidosis hyperuricemia and hyperlipidemia this is seen in type 1 glycogen storage disorder and that is von gierke's disease then another possibility is the type 6 which is rare i don't want to discuss it here because very rarely that is asked so this is type 
this is having severe hypoglycemia and we know that uh, like in the case of type 1 even gluconeogenesis is not able to support the blood glucose because the final enzyme which is glucose 6-phosphatase is absent. So, glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis is not possible here like the final culmination of no, none of this is possible because of this enzyme defect. So, there is severe hypoglycemia whereas in Hertz disease it is not a severe hypoglycemia because so I will just uh, say about that also here that is type 6 that is Hertz disease no severe hypoglycemia there is no severe hypoglycemia and in Hertz disease uh, all the features like hyperuricemia, lactic acidosis all these things are usually not a biochemical hallmark of Hertz disease. It is all because of the accumulation of glucose 6-phosphate. So, uh, that is about the Hertz disease usually not asked. So, but I just want to concentrate only on the type 1 here. So, in the case of type 1 von Gierke's disease all these biochemical hallmarks are there. Okay. So, if these lactate level, uric acid level, lipid level is normal, then we should think about type 3 and type 4, right. So, in the case of type 3 and type 4, uh, common what we can see is that there is features of liver cirrhosis. So, there is increased liver enzymes that is the transaminases. What is transaminases? Transaminases are the ALT and the AST. So, these enzymes will be elevated both in type 3 and type 4. Then how can we divide uh, these two or how can we distinguish between type 3 and type 4? The Type 3 we know it is Cori's disease. In Cori's disease liver failure uh, sorry the cirrhosis are the features of cirrhosis is there, but it is uh, usually a reversible condition it is not a fatal condition not fatal, but what about uh, the and uh, the type 4 the type 4. So, this is the type 4 which is Anderson disease in in this case it is it progress to cirrhosis is there and this cirrhosis progress to liver failure progress to liver failure and death usually death by around 5 years. So, it is a fatal condition the other one is not a fatal condition like uh, type 4. Okay. So, this is one way that we can differentiate between the various glycogen storage disorder. I will help you in one way also uh, like that is about uh, dividing the branches based on the biochemical investigation lactic acid and uh, hyperuricemia and uh, hyperlipidemia. Uh, now, what I want to tell you is about uh, another way that we can differentiate because that is also asked in the question. So, that is uh, by seeing the uh, glycogen liver biopsy and uh, in th there is increased glycogen. So, that divides into two no glycogen. So, no glycogen is glycogen synthase defect glycogen synthase. So, there is increased glycogen ok. Then usually what is given in the question is this glycogen is normal glycogen whatever is accumulated is normal glycogen or this can be abnormal glycogen. Abnormal glycogen now normal glycogen then uh, the possibilities are the type 1. von Gierke's disease abnormal glycogen abnormal glycogen if it is mentioned then what is the abnormal glycogen either it is mentioned like this glycogen with multiple short branches 
multiple short branches then it is in favor of limit dextrin so limit dextrin is accumulated if there is a defect in debranching enzyme debranching that is why there is multiple short branches so that is in favor of what it is in favor of Cori's disease Cori's disease then what about the other branch the other branch is uh, abnormal glycogen but it is given that a glycogen which is having few branches it is a type of glycogen with a few branches only so this is because of a defect in branching enzyme so this branching enzyme defect is amylopectin that is called an amylopectin and this disorder is amylopectinosis amylopectinosis otherwise anderson disease otherwise type 4 glycogen storage disorder and here it is branching enzyme that is what we have learned as a b c d cori's disease d branching enzyme anderson disease branching enzyme okay so this is how we can differentiate between various uh, various glycogen storage disorder so what i have uh, shown you or told told you is about just see where or when the drowsiness happen that is in the between meals then go for liver then if it's after exercise then go for muscle glycogen storage disorder now i told you that i will tell you about this m um, muscle glycogen storage disorder as well so we will see that now so in the case of muscle glycogen storage disorder uh, the two branches or how we can differentiate is that muscle glycogen storage disorder we can divide like this uh, with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and without hypertrophic cardiomyopathy this is the first thing that is whether there is cardiomegaly or not so if there is cardiomegaly and especially it's given a floppy infant with a hypotonia so a floppy infant with hypotonia because muscle is affected so that is saying that it is muscle glycogen storage disorder with the uh, cardiomegaly so this is called as a pompis disease that is type 2 so here the enzyme defect is acid maltase or it is also called acid alpha 14 glucosidase okay and this is an enzyme present in the lysosomes so that is why the pompis disease is a lysosomal storage disorder as well okay then we have the second branch without hypertrophic cardiomyopathy so there we have to see that uh, whether there is a second wind phenomenon what is second wind phenomenon pain appears after exercise so pain after exercise after exercise then after a period of rest the pain subsides pain subsides and this is called what this is the second wind phenomenon so if the second wind phenomenon is there or not okay so if the second wind phenomenon is there then it is what it is the type 5 muscle glycogen storage disorder and that is mccardell's disease mccardell's disease then if there is no second wind phenomenon that is type 7 which is tarui's disease tarui's disease so one additional feature of tarui's disease is that there is there is no second wind phenomenon but here we know that the erythrocyte erythrocyte and muscle phosphofructokinase is affected so as erythrocyte pfk is affected there is an additional feature called as hemolysis 
okay and all the muscle glycogen storage disorder irrespective of whether it is mccardell's or tarubis there will be having burgundy colored urine because of myoglobinuria because of rhabdomyolysis that is common but the hemolysis is a feature only of tarubis disease i hope that's clear so this is how we can differentiate between various glycogen storage disorder whatever is a question either of any of this clues will be there in the question fine so what we have seen in that question is a 16 year old boy so adolescent age tiredness and muscle cramps uh, especially after playing so there is exercise intolerance there is no free glucose and low lactate level why there is low lactate level because the muscle glycogen it's just uh, it's a something which is affecting the muscle glycogen we know that in the muscle the glycogen which is undergoing glycogenolysis becomes glucose 6 phosphate which is going in for glycolysis which is anaerobic glycolysis especially because of exercising muscle anaerobic glycolysis it goes for lactate so as this uh, pathway is affected there is low lactate then why there is no free glucose it is because you know the, this is a case of muscle glycogen storage disorder so the muscle glycogen as there is no muscle glycogen finally what happens is that you know the the muscle has a in vitro or what you can say that it has an in situ source for um, energy that is the muscle glycogen so as that is not taking that is not there then what the body will do or what the muscle will do it will extract glucose from the blood because it is not able to metabolize this uh, glycogen and uh, uh, produce energy so doesn't know muscle doesn't know what to do so it will extract glucose from the blood and hence what will happen the blood glucose level decreases the blood glucose level is decrease so this will happen not during early fasting or what you can say in between the meals so that is there only if there is a liver glycogen storage disorder low blood glucose in between the meals but here low blood glucose following exercise so that is a feature of muscle glycogen storage disorder i hope that's clear so we will go to the next set of questions that came from the lipids a child presented with bone pain on examination cherry red spot is seen there is no organomegaly diagnosis is so here uh, we can straight away exclude hurler syndrome because cherry red spot is not a feature of hurler's disease or hurler syndrome then gaucher disease gaucher disease we have seen that there is no cherry red spot in gaucher disease and fabrous disease so that is also out of the question it is not the answer then we are confused between tay sachs and neiman pix disease so among this there is no organomegaly in tay sachs disease not neiman pix disease so i will just give you an algorithm to solve these kind of sphingolipidosis so whenever a question is coming in sphingolipidosis the first characteristic finding that we have to search in the history of or the scenario that is given us the cherry red spot okay so that will divide it into two cherry red spot plus or cherry red spot minus so if there is no cherry red spot then the possibilities are gaucher disease or fabrous disease gaucher disease or fabrous disease so how can we find out whether it is fabrous or gaucher so for that what we can look for is the visceromegaly 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 is plus in gaucher and also we know that gaucher's disease have lots other features which is very very characteristic we know that the gaucher disease is something which is affecting the enzyme beta gluco cerebrosidase so beta gluco cerebroside accumulate especially in extra neural tissues and the 
the most important here is the bone marrow okay so if bone marrow if it is accumulating we know that the erythropoiesis is affected so there is anemia then there is abnormal platelets which is engulfed by the macrophages so there is uh, thrombocytopenia so there is bleeding manifestation and because the bone marrow is affected there is pain and pathological fact fractures especially of long bones and we all know the very characteristic finding in the uh, gaucher cell that is gaucher disease is the gaucher cell it is because of the accumulated glucocerebroside uh, and uh, glucocerebroside which is accumulated is causing this kind of uh, gaucher cell which is giving a crumpled tissue paper appearance so there is no entrance exam without crumpled tissue paper is the di dictum nowadays okay so that you all know so i am not going to uh, go in detail about that so if there is visceromegaly it goes for gaucher disease if there is no visceromegaly then it goes in favor of fibrous disease okay then fibrous disease also has uh, very uh, so many peculiar features like fibrous crisis just like sickle cell crisis the pain in the excruciating pain in the proximal areas pain and swelling so that is fibrous crisis and we know about decreased sweating then usually only males are affected here then there is a special feature which is called angiokeratoma angiokeratoma and we know that there is a maltese cross appearance in the urinary sediment so these are all features of fibrous disease very uh, very easy to identify a case of fibrous disease okay so that is the branch where there is no cherry red spot but if there is no cherry red spot we have to keep one more disease in our mind that is krebs disease or krebs disease so in krebs disease or krebs disease uh, the cherry red spot can be plus or minus okay so if this is a krebs disease without cherry red spot then how can we identify it so in the case of if it is a cherry red spot minus krebs disease then the krebs disease is also having uh, very important features like it has severe neurological deficits okay and here there is no visero megaly because the enzyme that is defective in krebs disease is beta galacto cerebrosidase okay unlike gaucher which is beta glucocerebrosidase here it is beta galacto cerebrosidase so the galacto cerebroside accumulate accumulate in the neural tissues unlike the beta glucocerebroside accumulate in the extra neural tissue so that is there is that's why there is a neurological deficit and there is an inclusion body that we can see in krebs disease and that is uh, globoid cell inclusion so globoid cell inclusion bodies if it is given in the history it is a case of krebs disease okay so that is about the krebs disease that is we have to be careful krebs disease uh, cr spot can be plus or minus okay then uh, the other branch what i have told you is a uh, cherry red spot present so if cherry red spot is present then what we have to look there next is the visceromegaly visceromegaly so the visceromegaly if it is present or it can be absent so if visceromegaly is present then the possibilities cr spot plus visceromegaly plus the possibilities are gm1 gangliosidosis and neman pick disease
another possibility is Farber's disease. So, in all these things, there will be some feature which will help us to identify which is the sphingolipidosis. For example, in GM1 gangliosidosis, there is typical facial features. Typical facies are there, which is having low set ears, long philtrum, depressed nasal bridge, frontal bossing, etc. Then Neiman Pick's disease. Neiman Pick's disease, uh, the characteristic feature is the severe neurological deficit. And there is organomegaly. So that is Neiman Pick's disease. Whereas what is the enzyme defect in uh, Neiman Pick's disease? It is sphingomyelinase. Sphingomyelinase. In GM1 gangliosidosis, the enzyme defect is beta galactosidase. Okay. Then we have Farber's disease. In the case of Farber's disease, there is a very peculiar feature that is, uh, it has a feature of rheumatoid arthritis. This child will be having features of rheumatoid arthritis. So, some distinguishing feature will be there to find out which is the sphingolipidosis. Now, we go to the next branch which is called as the cherry red spot is present but there is no organomegaly. So, in that is uh, what is given in the question also that branch is. So, CR spot plus and visceromegaly plus we have discussed minus. So, there is no visceromegaly. The possibilities are number 1, GM2 gangliosidosis. GM2 gangliosidosis include two types that is Tay-Sachs disease and Sandoz disease. Okay. So, in this Tay-Sachs disease, uh, there is no visceromegaly. But Sandhoff's disease, in some cases, there is hepatosplenomegaly. So, in that question, what is given was Tay-Sachs disease. So, Sandhoff's disease, in the books, it is given, there is possibility of hepatosplenomegaly. Apart from that, generally considering GM2 gangliosidosis, there is no organomegaly. The second option uh, in the GM2 gangliosidosis, uh, sorry, in the cherry red spot plus and visceromegaly is not seen is the metachromatic leukodystrophy, MLD, that is metachromatic leukodystrophy. That is also there is a severe neurological deficit and there is no organomegaly in metachromatic leukodystrophy. Then one more possibility is the third one that is Krabs disease. Krebs disease, which I have already told you, cherry red spot plus or minus is there. So, if the cherry red spot is present and there is no organomegaly, then we have to think about Krebs disease. So, Krebs disease is common to cherry red spot plus or minus. So, we will summarize uh, what we have learned. That is, the first thing that we have to look is the cherry red spot. So, cherry red spot plus or minus. So, if uh, this is minus this is plus okay so if cherry red spot is not present then look for visceromegaly then the visceromegaly if it is mentioned in the question then what we have to think about is the gotcha disease if visceromegaly is not mentioned if there is no organomegaly then what we have to think is the fibrous disease and the Krebs disease then cr spot is uh, present and we think about the visceromegaly, then if the visceromegaly is present, then the possibilities are GM1 gangliosidosis, Neiman Pick's disease and the Farber's disease. If there is no visceromegaly, then what we have to think about is the GM2 gangliosidosis, which include the Tay-Sachs disease and the metachromatic leukodystrophy and also Krebs disease because it is a common factor for both. I hope that is clear. So, we will see the question once again. So, this is a child that presents with the bone pain on examination, cherry red spot is seen and there is no organomegaly. So, cherry red spot plus and no organomegaly, it is uh, 
Niemann-Pick disease is not because we know that there is uh, organomegaly present in Niemann-Pick disease. Gaucher disease, there is visceromegaly. Hurler disease is not coming under this category. And the answer hence is the GM2 gangliosidosis which include Tay-Sachs disease. So, I will just show you some images of the sphingolipidosis very fast. So, this is uh, frontal bursting, depressed nasal bridge, long philtrum, long set ears, cherry red spot is there that is GM1 gangliosidosis. Then uh, this is a case where you can see severe hypotonia and you can see there is cherry red macular spot is there. This is GM2 gangliosidosis. So, in GM2 gangliosidosis no visceromegaly is mentioned. So, uh, and also we know that there are Tay-Sachs and Sandoz, but say in Sandoz disease there is possibility of hepatosplenomegaly. Then this is Niemann-Pix disease. So, in Niemann-Pix disease there is cherry red spot. You can see that there is cherry red spot and you can see there is uh, visceromegaly. So, visceromegaly is present, cherry red spot is there and uh, this is sphingomyelin is accumulating and this is Niemann-Pix disease and very one important another feature of Niemann-Pix disease is zebra body inclusions. Uh, this is uh, uh, another question, a uh, child presented with bone pain, hepatosplenomegaly, so bone pain, visceromegaly is there, anemia is there and a biopsy as per it show the following findings. You all are very familiar with this, this is the crumpled tissue paper appearance, tissue paper appearance that is the Gaucher disease, in Gaucher disease. Uh, the enzyme that is defective here is beta glucocerebrosidase and the accumulating substance is beta glucocerebroside and we all know that it is a lysosomal storage disorder and this is the most common lysosomal storage disorder. I have already explained about Gaucher disease. So, these are some of the images of the Gaucher disease where you can see there is visceromegaly. What about cherry red spot? Cherry red spot is not present here. There is Gaucher cell and what is this in the low uh, x-ray of the lower limb shows the Erlenmeyer flask deformity. So, till now we have discussed about the two very important uh, like categories like the glycogen storage disorder and the sphingolipidosis. Now, this is a question that came from the general conceptual topic that is the insulin glucagon ratio. I have very well explained about the insulin glucagon ratio in the general topics. Uh, so, I do not want to explain it here once more, but I just tell you what is the answer here, a low insulin glucagon ratio. Low insulin glucagon ratio means that insulin level is uh, low, but glucagon level is high or something like there is low insulin glucagon ratio means that it is in the stage of low insulin. Low insulin means what? It is in the stage of fasting or fed, it is in the stage of fasting. So, in the stages of fasting, uh, all the enzymes are active like in the stage of fasting under the influence of glucagon and the enzymes active under the influence of glucagon is active in which state in which covalent modified state it is active in the phosphorylated state whereas in the fed state under the influence of insulin most of the enzymes are active in the enzymes active are active under in the dephosphorylated state. Okay, so what we have to look for here is all these enzymes are active in fed or fasting. So, what we have seen low insulin glucagon ratio means that it is fasting. Okay, so hormone sensitive lipase we all know that it is the one which releases the uh, like uh, 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 triazole glycerol from the adipose tissue as fatty acid and glycerol. So, that is one that is taking place in the fasting state. Lipoprotein lipase is an enzyme which act on the uh, uh, VLDL as well as chylomicron. So, VLDL carries endogenously synthesized fatty acid. So, endogenously synthesized fatty acid means the body is in fed or fasting, it is the body uh, is in the fed state and chylomicron, it metabolizes chylomicron. It is the one which carry exogenous fat uh, triacylglycerol which means that again the body is in a stage of fed. So, so lipoprotein lipase is an enzyme which act on VLDL which where the body is in a fed state and chylomicron when the body is in a fed state. So, lipoprotein lipase is a enzyme in the fed state. HMG coenzyme reductase, it is an enzyme for cholesterol synthesis, again fed. Glycogen synthase which means that the body is in a stage of fed, so that is also fed state. 
Okay, so here what the answer here is the fasting stage enzyme active in the fasting stage and that is horm hormone sensitive lipase. An infant presented with the uh, urine turns black on standing, the probable cause. It's a very, very commonly asked question. Uh, we all know about uh, this case and that is alkyptonu. That is alkyptonuria. So, in alkyptonuria, because the enzyme, because of the absence of the enzyme, homogentisate oxidase, oxidase homogentisate is the one which is accumulating, which is converted to benzoquinone acetate, which later converted to alkyptone. Alkyptone means black, alkyptone bodies. So, that is black in color. Okay, so the so there is blackish discoloration of urine on standing. There is blackish discoloration on the sclera, on the dosum of the hand, etc. Again, then there is a, a accumulation of this alkyptone bodies in the intervertebral disc, which causes ochronosis and low backache. Phenylketonuria is having a different presentation with hypopigmentation, mousy body odor, agitated behavior, mental retardation, etc. What about alkyptonuria? Is there any mental retardation? No, there is no mental retardation. Okay. Uh, then uh, maple syrup urine disease, uh, burnt sugar smell. So that is in the branched chain amino acid. Again, it is not there, uh, like which is there is no blackening of urine there. Homocysteinuria. Homocysteinuria is something which present with mental retardation and lots of skeletal manifestation and the manifestation in the eyes, which where there is dislocation of the lens. And the enzyme that is defective there is cystathionine beta synthase. So, definitely, this is a case of alkyptonuria. So, now we are entering into the vitamin question, which is lots of lots of vitamin questions were there. Uh, this is an alcoholic patient presented with a confusion, painful eye movements and ataxia. He is likely to have a deficiency. Of. Alcoholic patients definitely they will be having nutritional deficiency, especially the absorption of vitamin B1 is affected. So, there will be a deficiency of thiamine. Thiamine defect is there. Uh, they have a confusion, painful eye movements and ataxia. He is likely to have a deficiency of vitamin B1. So, we will see the uh, something about this vitamin B1, we will revise it here, we, you all know it, but just to revise. So, thiamine deficiency causes wet beriberi. So, wet beriberi is characterized by high output cardiac failure with the uh, cardio cardiomegaly, especially the right heart is affected. Then uh, dry beriberi is usually affects the nerves where there is a symmetrical motor as well as uh, sensory neuropathy. So, there is pain, paresthesia, loss of reflexes, all these are things are there, but legs are affected more than arms. There will be muscle cramps, atrophy. So, generally it is a neurological feature which affects the uh, peripheral, so peripheral neuropathy which affects the motor as well as sensory. Then uh, another uh, feed is the vernix encephalopathy. In vernix encephalopathy, there is horizontal nystagmus. So, whatever is given in that question is there. Horizontal nystagmus, ophthalmoplegia, which is causing the tosses of the eyelid and um, atrophy of optic nerve is there. Trungal ataxia confusion. So, that was a case of vernix encephalopathy. All the features are there. So, it is B1 deficiency causing vernix encephalopathy. Uh, then vernix korsakoff syndrome. What is vernix korsakoff syndrome? All the features of vernix encephalopathy plus there is amnesia or dementia and uh, confabulatory psychosis. If these two things are added to vernix encephalopathy, then it is called vernix korsakoff syndrome. Then what is the assay method? Assay method is some enzyme which is activated by thiamine. So, most of the dehydrogenase, pyruvate dehydrogenase, branched chain keto acid dehydrogenase, then um, BCKD, then uh, alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase, all these require thiamine. But uh, what we usually do an assay method is something which is very accessible to us and for that uh, we take erythrocyte. So, from erythrocyte we cannot measure pyruvate dehydrogenase because pyruvate dehydrogenase is an enzyme present inside the mitochondria. The erythrocyte is not having mitochondria. So, when we want to take something very easily, then erythrocyte is the one which is which we can act, which uh, we can take out very easily through the, from from the blood. So, erythrocyte transketolase is there. 
which is an enzyme that is dependent on thiamine. Then urinary thiamine assay, these are the assay method. Then another again a question on uh, thiamine itself, uh, family eating only polished rice. What is polished rice? Polished rice means the rice where that uh, outer uh, brown covering over a grain is removed. So once the brown covering over the grain is removed, what is uh, removed along with it is the a layer which is seen under this brown cover which is almost attached to this brown outer covering that is called as the aleurone layer. So that aleurone layer is also taken out when the rice is, is polished. So white rice eating white rice is not good for our health because B1 is already removed and al always remember for carbohydrate metabolism you know grain means it is mostly carbohydrate for carbohydrate metabolism God has provided the vitamin for carbohydrate metabolism along with this grain in the aleurone layer which we are taking out when we make a polished rice okay. So, in a polished rice, the aleurone layer is removed. So, vitamin deficient with the investigation to detect the deficiency. So, that makes things a bit complicated. Okay. So, uh, if we want to preserve this uh, aleurone layer, uh, there is a technique which is used in conservatively in Indian families and all is that is the that technique is called par boiling. Par boiling. Par boiling means that we will uh, heat this rice once and uh, in a big in a big vessel we'll we'll uh, first we the rice before like the uh, whatever is the grain that we are getting from the paddy field we'll heat it inside the water and then only after drying it then only we'll pound it so by doing this we are preserving the aleurone layer which is called par boiling so, this par boiling preserves the aleurone layer and preserves the vitamin B1. So, if there is a deficiency of B1, what is the enzyme assay that we are doing? Will we do a transaminase assay? No, transaminase is dependent on B6. So, definitely it is not. Riboflavin, riboflavin has nothing to do with the polished rice. So, that is again the enzyme that is given here is correct. For uh, riboflavin deficiency, erythrocyte. Glutathione reductase activity reductase activity is measured. That is correct, but for this question, it is not a riboflavin deficiency, hence that is not the answer. Then pyridoxine and xanthiurinic acid, that is also a right combination, but this is not the answer here because it has nothing to do with polished rice. So, pyridoxine and xanthiurinic acid, in pyridoxine deficiency, there is excretion of xanthiurinic acid and urinary xanthiurinic acid can be measured. So, that assay method is correct, but this is not the answer here. So, the answer here is thiamine and transketolase because transketolase is dependent on thiamine. A child bought, uh, with, uh, brought with uh, pedal edema, chelosis, cardiomegaly, which is the vitamin that is deficient. So, uh, here this is very characteristic. High output cardiac failure, cardiomegaly, all these are features of what it is uh, a case of wet beriberi. So, that is thiamine. But riboflavin is also something which confuses us, but cardiomegaly is not a feature of riboflavin deficiency. Hence, the answer here is thiamine. A patient has diarrhea, dermatitis, dementia, the three Ds that you all know and asked in every paper. So, that is the three Ds of B3 or niacin deficiency. But actually, there are four Ds. I will say the five Ds are there. I will show that later. So, B3 deficiency, dermatitis, diarrhea, dementia. The This diarrhea, you all know, dermatitis, what is the peculiarity of dermatitis in B3 deficiency? It is photosensitive, photosensitive dermatitis, so which affects only the sun exposed area. So, that is why there is uh, scaling and erythematous lesion in the sun exposed area, which causes castles necklace plus dementia, then it is vitamin B3. So, we will see a bit about vitamin B3 and B2 together. 
So, first I will discuss vitamin B3 otherwise nicotinic acid 4 D's uh, this causes what is a deficiency manifestation called pellagra. The 4 D's of pellagra are photosensitive dermatitis, diarrhea, dementia, death and fifth D in uh, this niacin or B3 deficiency is the depressive psychosis. Uh, it is also seen in uh, B3 deficiency. Okay. Then what about toxicity? Niacin toxicity is also there which causes prostaglandin mediated flushing. So, what is the treatment for it? We can pre-treatment pre-treatment with aspirin and there is another treatment or another drug called larovibrand that is also a treatment for this prostaglandin mediated flushing. So, that is uh, one vitamin B complex vitamin that can cause toxicity also. Then going to the riboflavin, riboflavin uh, usually the uh, tongue and the lips are affected where there is glossitis, low, when there is um, loss of papilla in the tongue and there is fissuring of tongue, chelosis uh, where you can see fissuring of the lips, uh, then eye where we can see keratitis, corneal vascularization, very very important corneal vascularization, seborrheic dermatitis in the skin and anemia. Here the anemia is normocytic, normochromic anemia. Act, uh, the assay method is um, activation of erythrocyte glutathione reductase by adding uh, because it is a flavin dependent enzyme. So, by adding FAD. So, uh, once you add FAD also this enzyme will act. So, activation of erythrocyte glutathione reductase activity by adding FAD. Uh, so, uh, if there is no activity even by adding FAD that means that there is a uh, like a, uh, activation is there then uh, there is a deficiency of there is a deficiency of uh, riboflavin there is no activation of glutathione reductase. So, these are some of the images where you can see this is uh, given in it is an image that is given in Harrison which you can see it is a manifestation of uh, niacin deficiency which is given as indurated lichenified pigmented scaly lesion which is called gauntlet of pellagra and that is seen in niacin deficiency. This is the uh, castle's necklace where we can see it is a photosensitive dermatitis. This is a patient who is uh, uh, on treatment for hypertriglyceridemia. For hypertriglyceridemia we give a vitamin that is uh, vitamin B3 as a treatment. So, on receiving the treatment on high doses, he, he developed a flushing that is prostaglandin mediated flushing, it is a niacin toxicity. Uh, so, the treatment here is laropiprin or you can do a pre medication with the aspirin. So, this is uh, the beefy red colored tongue or magenta tongue, then what we can see here is the chelosis, the sides of the lips you can see, this is the fissuring of the lips and corneal vascularization. So, what are uh, the vitamin, which vitamin deficiency is associated with all these images and that is riboflavin deficiency. Now, another uh, history where uh, given in the question was a child has thinning of hair or scaling of skin. So, something which is affecting the hair and the nail. On further asking it is found that she consumes a raw egg in her diet. So, a uh, raw egg is having uh, something called avidin, right? This avidin inhibit what? A vitamin that is biotin. You know, biotin is a vitamin required for skin and hair, okay? So, if there is a deficiency of biotin, hair thinning will happen, scaling of skin is also seen in the particular patient. Apart from that, we know all the enzymes which require biotin is affected. For example, pyruvate carboxylase. So, biotin is a enzyme for uh, sorry coenzyme for all the carboxylases enzymes. So, it affects the enzyme pyruvate carboxylase 
This pyruvate carboxylase is an enzyme for gluconeogenesis. So, in these patients, there will be uh, tiredness, especially on prolonged fast, on fasting in uh, on the fasting stages, those with biotin deficiency will be having tiredness. So, we will discuss about uh, the biotin otherwise called as vitamin H or vitamin B7, B7 it is also called anti egg white injury factor. So, it is pre previously considered as something which prevent from egg white injury, but we at uh, that time we were not aware of this avidin or biotin or anything like that, but anti egg white that is egg white if you are taking some injury is happening. So, it is something related to that is present in the egg white was not previously itself and those time this uh, vitamin were, was called as anti egg white injury factor. Okay, so, hair it causes uh, thinning of hair and alopecia, uh, then skin it causes seborrheic dermatitis that is why there is scaling of the skin and nail it causes atrophy. So, these are the deficiency manifestation of biotin. So, uh, what how will you assay decreased activity uh, decreased activity of biotin dependent enzymes uh, especially in the lymphocyte. For example, we have uh, so many carboxylases like pyruvate carboxylases there then acetyl coenzyme A carboxylase. So, any carboxylase enzyme activity can be measured in the lymphocyte and increased excretion of uh, a compound called hydroxyvaleric acid after leucine challenge because for this um, like uh, uh, in the case of if you are giving a leucine, if you are giving a leucine challenge uh, for the complete metabolism of leucine biotin is required in one step which is not there and hence if there is a biotin deficiency there is uh, excretion of hydroxyvaleric acid and uh, there is decreased urinary biotin. In the case of pantothenic acid that is vitamin B5 which is a part of almost every coenzyme, coenzyme A uh, deficiency causes uh, nutritional melalgia. Indian name for this nutritional melalgia is known by an Indian scientist and that is Gobalan's uh, burning food syndrome and this is actually a peripheral nerve damage. So, again another question on vitamin a patient presented with a neurological manifestation mimicking upper motor neuron palsy and sensory neuropathy. The patient was pale. So, there is anemia and upper motor neuron and sensory neuropathy. What is that called as? That is called as subacute combined degeneration combined degeneration S A C D plus anemia. So, the probable micronutrient deficient it is very clear it is defect in cobalamin B 12. So, we will see about these two vitamins together uh, folic acid and cobalamin. So, first we will see the cobalamin which is vitamin B 12 it causes anemia. What anemia? Megaloblastic anemia and there is subacute combined degeneration which affects the peripheral causes peripheral neuropathy as well as demyelination in the posterior column and the pyramidal tract. So, uh, that is why there is upper motor neuron palsy. Uh, so, how will you assay a uh, vitamin B12? One is serum cobalamin ok. Then uh, this I will explain serum methyl melonate, melonate and homocysteine. Uh, so, that is the same thing here serum methyl melonic acid. Then peripheral smear what we can see is macrocytes in the bone marrow what we can see is megaloblast. So, we will see the other vitamin also then we will discuss it together. Then folic acid otherwise vitamin B9. So, in folic acid megaloblastic anemia is there then there is no neurological deficit like the SACD is not there, uh, but in the like in the pregnancy if you are not having adequate folate level it causes neural tube defects like an encephaly and all uh, which is seen if in during the pregnancy we are not having adequate folate level. Then assay method serum folate of course, red cell folate also you can see fig glue excretion because uh, this is uh, hist in histidine metabolism for the conversion of 4-miminoglutamic acid that is 4-miminoglutamic acid 
to glutamate. We need tetrahydrofolic acid. So, if there is no tetrahydrofolic acid, formiminoglutamic acid is not converted to glutamate. So, it is excreted. So, figlu excretion is seen, figlu excretion. Uh, then peripheral smear macrocytes, bone marrow, megaloblast, which is common in folic acid as well as uh, B12. So, we will just see which are the B12 requiring enzyme and then we will compare the mole folic acid and the B12. So, uh, this cobalamin or B12 is required for two enzymes homocysteine methyl transferase. So, this is the enzyme which convert homocysteine to methionine. Uh, op apart from that, this is also required for methyl melonyl coenzyme A mutase which convert methyl malonic acid to succinyl coenzyme A. This is another enzyme like uh, another enzyme activity. So, if B12 is deficient, both these enzyme activities are affected. Now, we should also understand that that uh, this folic acid THFA is required for this enzyme homocysteine methyl transferase. So, what will happen if there is a B9 or a folic acid and a B12 defect in both these cases homocysteine is not getting converted to methionine. So, definitely homocysteine will be elevated both in folic acid as well as in B12. But uh, about the methyl malonyl coenzyme A mutase this is seen uh, this is an action only of tet uh, only of B12, not of tetrahydrofolic or folate is not required here. So, if there is a B12 deficiency, both homocysteine is elevated in the both cases, but B12 deficiency, the methyl malonic acid is elevated. This is not seen in folate deficiency. So, that is why in serum methyl malonic acid. Now, serum methyl malonate is elevated in cobalamin deficiency and what is the problem? This accumulation of methyl uh, malonic acid will affect the protein called myelin basic protein and this is the reason for neurological deficit. So, if there is neurological deficit accompanied with anemia, then it is B12. Only B, uh, anemia, then it is folic acid deficiency. And also remember, if a person is a complete vegan, complete vegan, strict vegans are deficient in B12. But strict non-vegans, strict uh, non-vegans which means they are not consuming any leafy vegetables then they are prone for folic acid deficiency and folic acid you know it is derived from the word folium. Folium means green leafy vegetables. Okay, so, uh, strict non-vegans strict non-vegans where they are not consuming any vegetarian diet then folic acid deficiency. Strict vegans where they are not consuming any non-vegetarian diet, then they can develop B12 deficiency. Then again another question on vitamin, a patient with bleeding gums, petechiae, easy bruisability was diagnosed with a scurvy. This is due to, so straight away it is given because of uh, developed scurvy and scurvy is because of which vitamin deficiency? Vitamin C deficiency and this is due to what? Why there is bleeding gums and petechiae? It is because of not due to low calcium inhibition of clotting factor, keratinization of epithelium. No, it is because of defective collagen formation. So, we will see some of the features of collagen and vitamin C together. That is in collagen formation, there are certain unique events. One is the hydroxylation of lysine and proline. So, for hydroxylation of lysine and proline, the enzyme is lysyl and the prolyl hydroxylase. For this, vitamin C and alpha ketoglutarate is required. And what is the importance of this hydroxylation? Hydroxylation is the one which helps in the triple 
triple helix formation and it is an intracellular event which means this take place inside the fibroblast where collagen synthesis is taking place it has two uh, uh, like uh, there are two branches intracellular events and extracellular events are there. So, this triple helix formation is an intracellular event for that for this triple helix formation hydroxylation of prolyl and lysyl residues should happen and for that vitamin C is required. So, for collagen formation vitamin C is required. Again another event is very unique for collagen is oxidative deamination of lysyl and hydroxylysyl residue which is an extracellular event. For that the enzyme is lysyl oxidase and for that the cofactor required is copper not vitamin C. But for this formation of hydroxylysyl residue we need vitamin C. This hydroxylysyl residue should undergo oxidative deamination with the help of copper. So, both copper and vitamin C is required for the synthesis of collagen. So, this event which is taking place that is oxidative deamination is taking place in the extracellular region and it is required for the covalent cross links. So, for covalent cross links vitamin C is not required. But for triple helix formation vitamin C is required uh, and in, uh, in uh, indirect way vitamin C is involved how because the hydroxyl lysyl residue is the one which is undergoing oxidative deamination by lysyl oxidase for that copper is required. So, all these are linked together whether there is copper deficiency or vitamin C deficiency covalent uh, like um, collagen formation is affected. Specifically by vitamin C what is affected is not covalent cross link but the formation of triple helix. Indirectly vitamin C is involved because the hydroxylysyl residue are the one which is undergoing oxidative de deamination by the enzyme lysyl oxidase and for that copper is required. So, I hope this uh, linking of vitamin C. So, in vitamin C deficiency collagen formation is defective. So, if collagen formation is defective we know that there is poor wound healing, bleeding gums, petechiae, splinter hemorrhage, then hemarthrosis, pseudoparalysis all these features are there. Okay, so, vitamin C deficiency there is curvy collagen defectors there and follicular hyperkeratosis is a feature of vitamin C deficiency as well as vitamin A deficiency. Vitamin A deficiency and vitamin C deficiency causes follicular hyperkeratosis and a characteristic uh, costochondral thickening which we are seeing as a roset, uh, rosary pattern is this rosary pattern is called scorbutic rosary. Then again I will just discuss about the pyridoxin which is not mentioned in any of this question. So, in pyridoxin deficiency peripheral neuropathy is there, anemia is there, but this anemia is microcytic hypochromic anemia. And here the assay of pyridoxin is by uh, checking for oxaluria is there, homocysteinuria is there. So, homocysteinuria and increased homocysteine is present in folic acid deficiency, B12 deficiency as well as B6 deficiency. If you see the metabolism of sulfur containing amino acid you can understand that. For the conversion of homocysteine to methionine we require folic acid as well as B12. For the conversion of this homocysteine to cysteine we need cystathionine beta synthase for that we need B6. So, if B6 deficiency also there is homocysteinuria and homocysteine elevation in the serum as well. So, these are some of the images of the scurvy where we can see the petechiae, bleeding gums, these are the splinter hemorrhage and this is the characteristic scorbutic rosary. Again another question on vitamin that is clotting factors that need gamma glutamyl transferase. It is 2, 7, 9, 10. So, we will just see the importance of vitamin K here. Vitamin K is uh, chemically a naphthoquinone derivative. There are three types of vitamin K, K1, K2 and K3. K1 is dietary, we get it from dietary source and that is called, that naphthoquinone is called philoquinone. Philo is something related to the food or the diet or the uh, dietary sources. So, philoquinone. Uh, then we have uh, K2 that is menaquinone it is produced by the bacterial flora then K3 K3 is a synthetic vitamin K and this is water soluble water soluble we know that adec is fat soluble 
A T E K R fat fat soluble. But this is a water soluble among the fat soluble vitamin, and that is vitamin K three is a water soluble fat soluble which is classified under fat soluble. K is classified under fat soluble, but this category of K which is K three or menadione is uh, water soluble. Okay, the it, this vitamin K is required for gamma carboxylation of clotting factors, which all factors two, seven, nine, ten. Then protein C, protein S, and in the osteocytes there is osteocalcin. Like uh, in the bone there is osteocalcin. In the kidney there is nephrocalcin, and a product of a gene called GAS six. All these are the proteins which has to undergo gamma carboxylation. So gamma carboxylation is required for calcium binding, especially of the clotting factor. We know the calcium binding is very important in the clotting mechanism. So without gamma carboxylation, this calcium binding will not take place. So the uh, clotting factors are two, seven, nine, and ten. So there was an image on the bolex, and what is the probable diagnosis was asked? It's a straightforward question. It's rickets. So we will see some of the images of rickets where we can see the bone formation is affected. Uh, these, uh, what we can see is the skeletal deformity. What is this deformity called as? It is called as the uh, wind swept deformity, and you can see the genu valgum as well as genu varum here. It's a normal. This is genu val, this genu valgum and genu varum, genu varum and genu valgum deformity, and both varum and valgum together, it is a wind swept deformity. And the X-ray pictures with the cupping, flaying, and all is a feature of rickets. Then uh, this is another uh, rosary pattern or uh, rosary pattern bead-like formation in the costochondral junction. And in the case of rickets, it is not scorbutic rosary. This is rachitic rosary. So I'll just show you the images of vitamin A also for completion sake. Uh, initial what we can see is the night blindness. Followed by there is dryness of the eye, which starts in the conjunctiva. So conjunctiva followed by corneal cirrhosis. This is the triangular region that you can see on the sclera. Uh, that is bitot spot, and you can see in the last stage even the cornea, everything is affected where there is it is degenerated, causing corneal ulcer, keratomalacia. This is a dramatic improvement in the eye after giving a vitamin A treatment. So I have just shown you the images of rickets, where is a vitamin D deficiency, and now I have just shown you the images of vitamin A deficiency in the eye. Now in the skin, vitamin A deficiency causes follicular hyperkeratosis, which is looking like the skin of a toad, toad skin appearance, and that is phrynoderma, follicular hyperkeratosis. Remember, follicular hyperkeratosis is seen not only in vitamin A deficiency but also in vitamin C deficiency. So this is a question: A child has perioral dermatitis, mucosal ulcer. Impaired epithelial wound healing, most likely mineral deficiency. So, in this question, actually, because of the sentence mineral deficiency in that sentence, it makes things very easy. And even though you don't know anything about zinc deficiency, you can answer this question because copper we know that it is nothing related to these kind of symptoms. Iron deficiency also no, calcium also not. So, we can definitely answer it as zinc. Now. With the zinc deficiency, what is this condition called as? This condition is called acrodermatitis enteropathica. So here there is zinc malabsorption. The gene defect is a transport protein slc so this is due to a gene defect slc 39a4 is the gene that is defect which causes zinc malabsorption and these uh, children will be having perioral dermatitis that is in the uh, and also you can see there is uh, dermatitis and ulcers in the perineal region plus there is muscle wasting then there is poor wound healing 
wound healing and it is an autosomal recessive condition and you can treat it with zinc supplementation. Zinc supplementation is the treatment. So, that is acrodermatitis enteropathica. So, going to the last question, a chronic alcoholic patient with gouty arthritis, what changes can be present in the patient? So, this is a chronic alcoholic, that is the hint, uh, which present with the gouty arthritis. So, this chronic alcoholic patient developed hyperuricemia. Hyperuricemia. Okay, so how can we uh, like link gout and alcoholism? First, we will discuss about the metabolism of because it is a chronic alcoholic. So, in a chronic alcoholics, what is the metabolism of alcohol? We know that alcohol is converted to an aldehyde and this aldehyde especially it is converted to an acetate. So, ethanol is converted to acetaldehyde which is converted to acetate and the enzyme here is the first case it is alcohol dehydrogenase, the second case is ALD that is al uh, acetaldehyde dehydrogenase. In both these dehydrogenases NAD plus is converted to NADH, here also NAD plus is converted to NADH. So, in a chronic alcoholic what we can see is there is high NADH to NAD plus ratio, ratio is high. Okay. Now, because of this high NADH to NAD plus ratio, what is the alter or me altered metabolism that is happening in chronic alcoholic? One thing that we should all remember is the conversion of pyruvate. We know pyruvate uh, can be converted to acetyl coenzyme A, pyruvate can be converted to lactate. Now, when pyruvate is converted to acetyl coenzyme A, we know that NAD plus is converted to NADH. When pyruvate is converted to lactate, we know the reverse is happening. NADH is converted to NAD plus. So, in a chronic alcoholic, which, uh, pa which metabolism will take place? Will it be converted to acetyl coenzyme A or it is converted to lactate? So, in a chronic alcoholic, because of excess NADH, you know NADH in this case is coming as a substrate. So, because of excess NADH, there is increased conversion of pyruvate to lactate. Whereas, this NADH here it is coming as a product. So, less of this pyruvate to acetyl coenzyme A, but more of pyruvate to lactic acid. So, in an alcoholic patient, what we can see is there is lactic acidosis lactic acidosis. So, because of lactic acidosis, why there is hyperuricemia or why there is gout? If there is lactic acidosis, it decreases the, one thing is that lactic acidosis, it crystallizes uric acid. Okay. Then another, pos another thing is that uh, it is increasing the renal threshold of urate or uric acid. So, what will happen if there is increased it is not excreted, uric acid is not excreted. So, in acidic environment, in acidic medium, uric acid whether it is lactic acidosis or metabolic acidosis, whatever is the acidosis in acidic environment uric acid is not excreted. So, if there is no uric acid excretion, and there is chances of crystallization of uric acid and this causes gout. Okay. So, how this alcoholism is related to gout we have seen. Now, we will come to the question, a chronic alcoholic patient with the gouty arthritis, what changes can be present in the patient? Low NADH to NAD plus ratio, no. Increased urate, yes. Increased lactate, yes. That is the answer. Urea and uh, 
chronic alcoholic they are not related so it is not the answer alcohol causes increase in alkaline phosphatase it is alkaline phosphatase it is not right alcoholism is not related to alcohol uh, alkaline phosphatase so what are the enzyme markers of alcoholism so the enzyme markers are enzyme markers or biomarkers for chronic alcoholism one gamma glutamyl transferase ggt the second is carbohydrate it is not an enzyme carbohydrate deficient it's a protein deficient transferrin it is also a marker it's a biomarker of chronic alcoholism then another thing that we should understand is that especially if it's an alcoholic liver disease what we'll say we'll say that ast alt ratio is more than 2 or more than 1 is suggestive of alcoholic liver disease so ast elevation is a marker of alcoholism carbohydrate deficient transferrin and gamma glutamyl transferase not alkaline phosphatase so the answer here is b so to summarize what we have discussed is most of the questions came from vitamins so in future exams whatever is the competitive exam please please every day learn vitamins otherwise it's a very volatile topic you will forget it very fast so every day you have to look uh, look into the topic of uh, vitamins and again what we can understand is that in the case of glycogen storage disorder i have given the explanation in a different perspective like if a question is asked in the history how you can identify that glycogen storage disorder same in the case of sphingolipidosis also i have given an algorithm where you can identify among the various sphingolipidosis and hope this session is useful to you thank you for watching all the best